Hello and welcome to the session on deep learning. My name is Mohan and in this video we are going to talk about what deep learning is all about. So this is what we are going to talk about today. Our agenda looks something like this. What is deep learning? Why do we need deep learning? And then what are the applications of deep learning? One of the main components, the secret sauce in deep learning is neural networks. So we're going to talk about what is neural network and uh, how it works and some of its components like for example, the activation function, the gradient descent and so on and so forth. So that uh, as a part of working of a neural network, we will go into a little bit more details how this whole thing works. So without much further ado, let's get started. So deep learning is considered to be a part of machine learning. So this diagram very nicely depicts what deep learning is. At a very high level, you have the all encompassing artificial intelligence, which is more a concept rather than a technology or a technical concept, right? So it is, it is more of a concept at a very high level, artificial intelligence. Under the hood is actually machine learning and deep learning. And machine learning is a broader concept, you can say, or a broader technology. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning. The primary difference between machine learning and deep learning is that deep learning uses neural networks and it is suitable for handling large amounts of unstructured data. And the last but not least, one of the major differences between machine learning and deep learning is that in machine learning, the feature extraction or the feature engineering is done by the data scientists manually. But in deep learning, since we use neural networks, the feature engineering happens automatically. So that's a little bit of a, a quick difference between machine learning and deep learning. And this diagram very nicely depicts the relation between artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Now, why do we need deep learning? Machine learning was there for quite some time and it can do a lot of stuff that probably what deep learning can do. But it's not very good at handling large amounts of unstructured data like images, voice, or even text for that matter. So traditional machine learning is not that very good at doing this. It, traditional machine learning can handle large amounts of structured data, but when it comes to unstructured data, it's a big challenge. So that is one of the key differentiators for deep learning. So that is number one. And increasingly for artificial intelligence, we need image recognition and we need to process, analyze images and voice. That's the reason deep learning is required compared to let's say, traditional machine learning. It can also perform complex uh, algorithms, more complex than let's say what machine learning can do. And it can achieve best performance with the large amounts of data. So the more you have the data, let's say reference data or label data, the better the system will do because the training process will be that much better. And last but not least, with deep learning, you can really avoid the manual process of feature extraction. Those are some of the reasons why we need deep Deep learning. Some of the applications of deep learning. Deep learning has made major inroads and it is a major area in which deep learning is applied is healthcare. And within healthcare, uh, particularly oncology, uh, which is uh, basically cancer related stuff. One of the issues with cancer is that a lot of cancers today are curable. They can be cured. They are detected early on. And the challenge with that is when a diagnostics is performed, let's say an image has been taken of a patient to detect whether there is cancer or not, you need a specialist to look at the image and determine whether it is the patient is fine or there is any onset of cancer. And the number of specialists are limited. So if we use deep learning, if we use automation here or if we use artificial intelligence here, then the system can, with a certain amount of the good amount of accuracy, determine whether a particular patient is having cancer or not. So the prediction or the detection process of a disease like cancer can be expedited. The detection process can be expedited, can be faster without really waiting for a specialist. We can obviously then once the application, once the artificial intelligence detects or predicts that there is an onset of a cancer, this can be cross-checked by a doctor. But at least the initial screen screening process can be automated and that is where the current focus is with respect to deep learning in healthcare. 
what else robotics is another area deep learning is majorly used in robotics and you must have seen nowadays robots are everywhere humanoids the industrial robots which are used for manufacturing process you must have uh, heard about sophia who got uh, citizenship with saudi arabia and so on there are multiple such robots which are knowledge oriented but there are also industrial robots that are used in industries in the manufacturing process and increasingly in security and also in defense for example image processing video is fed to them and they need to be able to detect objects obstacles and so on and so forth so that's where deep learning is used they need to be able to hear and make sense of the sounds that they are hearing that needs deep learning as well so robotics is a, a major area where deep learning is uh, applied then we have self-driving cars or autonomous cars you must have heard of google's autonomous car which has been tested for millions of miles and uh, pretty much incident free there were of course a couple of incidents here and there but it is uh, considered to be fairly safe and there are today a lot of automotive companies in fact pretty much every automotive company worth its name is investing in self-driving cars or autonomous cars and it is predicted that in the next probably 10 to 15 years these will be in production and they will be used extensively in real life right now they are all in R&D and in test phases but pretty soon these will be on the road so this is another area where deep learning is used and how is it used where is it used within autonomous driving the car actually is fed with video of surroundings and it is supposed to process that information process that video and determine if there are any obstacles it has to determine if there are any cars in the side it will detect whether it is driving in the lane also it has to determine whether the signal is green or red so that accordingly it can move forward or wait so for all these video analysis deep learning is used in addition to that the training overall training to drive the car happens in, in a deep learning environment so again a lot of scope here to use deep learning a couple of other applications are machine translation so today we have a lot of information information and very often this information is in one particular language and more specifically in English and people need information in, in various parts of the world it is pretty difficult for human beings to translate each and every piece of information or every document into all possible languages there are probably at least hundreds of languages or if not more to translate each and every document into every language is uh, pretty difficult Therefore, we can use deep learning to do pretty much like a real-time translation mechanism so we don't have to translate everything and keep it ready but we train applications or artificial intelligence systems that will do the translation on the fly for example you go to somewhere like China and you want to know what is written on a signboard now it is impossible for somebody to translate that and put it on the web or something like that so you have an application which is trained to translate stuff on the fly so you probably this can be running on your mobile phone on your smartphone you scan this the application will instantly translate that from Chinese to English that is uh, one then there could be web applications where there may be a research document which is all in maybe Chinese or Japanese and you want to translate that to study that document or in that case you need to translate that. so therefore deep learning is used in such situations as well and that is again on demand so it is not like you have to translate translate all these documents from other languages into English in one shot and keep it somewhere that is again an, pretty much an impossible task but on a need basis so you have systems that are trained to translate on the fly so machine translation is another major area where deep learning is used then there are a few other upcoming areas where synthesizing is done by neural nets for example music composition and generation of music so you can train a neural net to produce music even to compose music so so this is a fun thing this is still upcoming it, it needs a lot of effort to train such neural net it has been proved that it is possible so this is a relatively new area and on the same lines colorization of images so these two images on the left hand side is a grayscale image or a black and white image this was colored by a neural net or a deep learning application as you can see this has done a very good job of applying the colors and obviously this was trained to do this uh, colorization but yes this is one more application of deep learning now 
one of the major secret sauce of deep learning is neural network deep learning works on neural network or consists of neural network so let us see what is neural network neural network or artificial neural network is designed or based on the human brain now human brain consists of billions of small cells that are known as neurons artificial neural networks is in a way trying to simulate the human brain so this is a quick diagram of biological neuron a biological neuron consists of the major part which is the cell nucleus and then it has some tentacles kind of stuff on the top called dendrite and then there is like a long tail which is known as the axon further again at the end of this axon are what are known as synapses these in turn are connected to the dendrites of the next neuron and all these neurons are interconnected with each other therefore they are like billions of them sitting in our brain and they're all active they're working they based on the signals they receive signals as inputs from other neurons or maybe from other parts of the body and based on certain criteria they send signals to the neurons at the other end so they they get either activated or they don't get activated based on so it is like a binary gates so they get activated or not activated based on the inputs that they receive and so on so we will see a little bit of those details as we move forward in our artificial neuron but this is a biological neuron this is the structure of a biological neuron and artificial neural network is based on the human brain the smallest component of artificial neural network is an artificial neuron as shown here sometimes is also referred to as a perceptron now this is a very high level diagram the artificial neuron has a small central unit which will receive the input if it is doing let's say image processing the inputs could be pixel values of the image which is represented here as x1 x2 and so on each of the inputs are multiplied by what is known as weights which are represented as w1 w2 and so on there is in the central unit basically there is a summation of these weighted inputs which is like x1 into w1 plus x2 into w2 and so on the products are then added and then there is a bias that is added to that in the next uh, slide we will see that passes through an activation function and the output comes as a y which is the output and based on certain criteria the cell gets either activated or not activated so this output would be like a zero or a one binary format okay so we will see that in a little bit more detail but let's do a quick comparison between biological and artificial neuron just like a biological neuron there are dendrites and then there is a cell nucleus and synapse and, and an axon we have in the artificial neuron as well these inputs come like the dendrite if you will act like the dendrites there is a like a central unit which performs the summation of these uh, weighted inputs which is basically w1 x1 w2 x2 and so on and then a bias is added here and then that passes through what is known as an activation function okay so these are known as the weights w1 w2 and then there is a bias which will come out here and that is added the bias is by the way common for a particular neuron so there won't be like b1 b2 b3 and so on only weights will be one per input the bias is common for the entire neuron it is also common for or the value of the bias remains the same for all the neurons in a particular layer we will also see this as we move forward and we see deep neural network where there are multiple neurons so that's the output now the whole exercise of training a neuron is about changing these weights and biases as i mentioned this artificial neural network will consist of several such neurons and as a part of the training process these weights keep changing the initially they are assigned some random values through the training process the weights the whole process of training is to come up with the optimum values of w1 w2 and wn and then the b for or the bias for this particular neuron such that it gives an accurate output as required so let's see what exactly that means so the training process this is how it happens it takes the inputs each input is multiplied by a weight and these weights during training keep changing so initially they are assigned some random values and based on the output whether it is correct or wrong there is a feedback coming back and that will basically change these weights until 
it starts giving the right output that is represented in here as sigma i going from 1 to n if there are n inputs uh, w i into x i so this is the product of w1 x1 w2 x2 and so on right and there is a bias that gets added here and that entire thing goes to what is known as an activation function so essentially this is sigma of w i x i plus a value of bias which is a b so that entire thing goes as an input to an activation function now this activation function takes this as an input gives the output as a binary output it could be a 0 or a 1. There are, of course, to start with, let's assume it's a binary output. Later, we will see that there are different types of activation functions. So it need not always be binary output. But to start with, let's keep simple. So it decides whether the neuron should be fired or not. So that is the output, like a binary output 0 or 1. All right. So again, let me summarize this. So it takes the inputs. So if you're processing an image, for example, the inputs are the pixel values of the image, x1, x2, up to xn. There could be hundreds of these. So all of those are fed as, so these are some values. And these pixel values, again, can be from 0 to 256. Each of those pixel values are then multiplied with what is known as a weight. This is a numeric value, can be any value. So this is a number, w1. Similarly, w2 is a number. So initially, some random values will be assigned and each of these weights are multiplied with the input value and their sum, this is known as the weighted sum. So that is performed in this kind of the central unit. And then a bias is added. Remember, the bias is common for each neuron. So this is not, the bias value is not one bias value for per input. So just keep that in mind. The bias value, there is one bias per neuron. So it is like this summation plus bias is the output from this section. This is not the complete output of the neuron, but this is a bias for output for step one. That goes as an input to what is known as an activation function. And that activation function results in an output, usually a binary output like a zero or a one, which is known as the firing of the neuron. Okay, good. So we talked about activation function. So what is an activation function? An activation function basically takes the weighted sum which is we saw w1 x1 w2 x2 the sum of all that plus the bias so it takes that as an input and it generates a certain output now there are different types of activation functions and the output is different for different types of activation functions moreover why is an activation function required it is basically required to bring in non-linearity that's the main reason why an activation function is required so what are the different types of activation functions there are several types of activation functions but these are the most common ones these are the ones that are currently in use sigmoid function was one of the early activation functions but today relu has kind of taken over so relu is by far the most popular activation function that is used today but still sigmoid function is still used in many situations these different types of activation functions are used in different situations based on the kind of problem we are trying to solve so what exactly is the difference between these two sigmoid gives the values of the output will be between zero and one threshold function is the value will be zero up to a certain value and beyond that this is also known as a step function and beyond that it will be one in case of sigmoid there is a gradual increase but in case of threshold it's like also known as a step function there is a rapid or instantaneous change from zero to one whereas in sigmoid we will see in the next slide there is a gradual increase but the value in this case is between zero and one as well now relu function on the other hand it is equal to basically if the input is zero or less than zero then the output is zero whereas if the input is greater than zero then the output is equal to the input i know it's a little confusing but in the next slides where we show the relu function it will become clear similarly hyperbolic tangent this is similar to sigmoid in terms of the shape of the function however while sigmoid goes from zero to one hyperbolic tangent goes from minus one to one and here again the increase or the change from minus one to one 
is gradual and not like threshold or step function where it happens instantaneously. So let's take a little detailed look at some of these functions. So let's start with the sigmoid function. So this is the equation of a sigmoid function which is 1 by 1 plus e to the power of minus x. So x is the value that is the input. It goes from 0 to minus 1. So this is sigmoid function. The equation is phi x is equal to 1 by 1 plus e to the power of minus x. And as you can see here, this is the input on the x-axis. As x is well, the value is coming from in fact it can also go negative this is negative actually so this is the zero so this is the negative value of x so as x is coming from negative value towards zero the value of the output slowly as it is approaching zero it it slowly and very gently increases and actually at the point let me just use a pen at the point here it is it is 0.5 it is actually 0.5 okay and slowly gradually it increases to 1 as the value of x increases but then as the value of x increases it tapers off it doesn't go beyond one. So that is the speciality of sigmoid function. So the output value will remain between 0 and 1. It will never go below 0 or above 1. Okay, that. So that is sigmoid function. Now, this is threshold function or this is also referred to as a step function. And here we can also set the threshold. In this case, it is, that's why it's called the threshold function. Normally, it is zero, but you can also set a different value for the threshold. Now, the difference between this and the sigmoid is that here the change is rapid or instantaneous. As the x value comes from negative up to zero, it remains zero. And at zero, it pretty much immediately increases to one. Okay, so this is a mathematical representation of threshold function. Phi x is equal to 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0 and 0 if x is less than 0. So for all negative values, it is 0 since we have set the threshold to be 0. So as soon as it reaches 0, it becomes 1. You see the difference between this and the previous one, which is basically the sigmoid, where the increase from 0 to 1 is gradual. And here it is instantaneous. And that's why this is also known as a step function, threshold function or step function. This is a ReLU. A ReLU is one of the most popular activation functions today. This is the definition of ReLU. Phi x is equal to max of x comma 0. What it says is if the value of x is less than 0, then phi x is um, zero. The moment it increases, goes beyond zero, the value of phi x is equal to x. So it doesn't stop at one. Actually, it goes all the way. So as the value of x increases, the value of y will also increase infinitely. So there is no limit here, unlike your sigmoid or threshold or the next one, which is basically hyperbolic tangent. Okay, so in case of ReLU, remember there is no upper limit. The output is equal to either 0 in case the value of x is negative or it is equal to the value of x. So for example, here if the value of x is 10, then the value of y is also 10. Right. Okay, so that is ReLU and there are several advantages of ReLU and it is much more efficient and uh, provides much more accuracy compared to other activation functions like sigmoid and so on. So that's the reason it is very popular. All right, so this is hyperbolic tangent activation function. The function looks similar to sigmoid function. The curve, if you see the shape, it looks similar to sigmoid function. But the difference between hyperbolic tangent and sigmoid function is that in case of sigmoid, the output goes from 0 to 1. Whereas in case of hyperbolic tangent, it goes from minus 1 to 1. So that is the difference between hyperbolic tangent and sigmoid function. Otherwise, the shape looks very similar. There is a gradual increase unlike the step function where there was an instant increase or instant change. Here again, very similar to sigmoid function, the value changes gradually from minus 1 to 1. So this is the equation of hyperbolic tangent activation function. Yeah, so then Let's move on. This is a diagrammatic representation of the activation function and how the overall data or how the overall progression happens from input to the output. So we get the input from the input layer. By the way, the neural network has three layers. Typically, there will be three layers. There is an input layer, there is an output layer, and then you have the hidden layer. So the input 
come from the input layer and they get processed in the hidden layer and then you get the output in the output layer. So let's take a little bit of a detailed look into the working of a neural network. So let's say we want to classify some images between dogs and cats. How do we do this? This is known as a classification process. And we are trying to use neural networks and deep learning to implement this classification. So how do we do that? So this is how it works. So you have four layer neural network. There is an input layer, there is an output layer, and then there are two hidden layers. And what we do is we provide labeled training data, which means these images are fed to the network with the label saying that, okay, this is a cat. The neural network is allowed to process it and come up with a prediction saying whether it is a cat or a dog. And obviously in the beginning, there may be mistakes. A cat may be classified as a dog. So we then say that, okay, this is wrong. This output is wrong. But every time it predicts correctly, we say, yes, this output is correct. So that learning process, so it will go back, make some changes to its weights and biases. We again feed these inputs and it will give us the output. We will check whether it is correct or not and so on. So this is a iterative process, which is known as the training process. So we are training the neural network. And what happens in the training process? These weights and biases, you remember there were weights like W1, W2 and so on. So these weights and biases keep changing every time you feed these, which is known as an epoch. So there are multiple iterations. Every iteration is known as an epoch. And each time the weights are dated to make sure that the maximum number of images are classified correctly. So once again, what is the input? This input could be like thousand images of cats and dogs and they are labeled because we know which is a cat and which is a dog and we feed those thousand images. The neural network will initially assign some weights and biases for each neuron and it will try to process, extract the features from the images and it will try to come up with a prediction for each image. And that prediction that is calculated by the network is compared with the actual value, whether it is a cat or a dog and that's how the error is calculated. So let's say there are 1000 images and in the first run only 500 of them have been correctly classified. That means we are getting only 50% accuracy. So we feed that information back to the network, further update these weights and biases for each of the neurons and we run this these inputs once again. It will try to calculate, extract the features and it will try to predict which of these is cats and dogs. And this time let's say out of 1000, 700 of them have been been predicted correctly. So that means in the second iteration, the accuracy has increased from 50% to 70%. All right. Then we go back again. We feed this maybe for a third iteration, fourth iteration and so on. And slowly and steadily, the accuracy of this network will keep increasing and it may reach probably, you never know, 90%, 95%. And there are several parameters that are known as hyperparameters that need to be changed and tweaked. And that is the overall training process. And ultimately, at some point, we say, okay, you will probably never reach 100% accuracy. But then we set a limit saying that, okay, if we receive 95% accuracy, that is good enough for our application. And then we say, okay, our training process is done. So that is the way training happens. And once the training is done, now with the training data set, the system has, let's say, seen all these thousand images. Therefore, what we do is the next step, like in any normal machine learning process, we do the testing where we take a fresh set of images and we feed it to the network, the fresh set which it has not seen before as a part of the training process. And this is again nothing new in deep learning. This was there in machine learning as well. So you feed the test images and then find out whether we are getting similar accuracy or not. So maybe that accuracy may reduce a little bit while training you may get 98% and then for test you may get 95%. But there shouldn't be a drastic drop like for example you get 98% in training and then you get 50% or 40% with the test that means your network has not learned you may have to retrain your network so that is the way neural network training works and remember the whole process is about changing these weights and biases and coming up with the optimal values of these weights and biases so that the accuracy is the maximum possible
All right, so a little bit more detail about how this whole thing works. So this is known as forward propagation, which is the data or the information is going in the forward direction. The inputs are taken, weighted summation is done, bias is added here, and then that is fed to the activation function and then that is that comes out as an output so that is forward propagation and the output is compared with the actual value and that will give us the error the difference between them is the error and in technical terms that is also known as our cost function and this is what we would like to minimize there are different ways of defining the cost function but one of the simplest ways is mean square error so it is nothing but the square of the difference of the errors or the sum of the squares of the difference of the errors and this is also nothing new we have probably if you're familiar with machine learning you must have come across this mean square error now there are different ways of defining cost function it need not always be the mean square error but the most common one is this so you define this cost function and you ask the system to minimize this error so we use what is known as an optimization function to minimize this error and the error itself sent back to the system as feedback and that is known as back propagation and so this is the cost function and how do we optimize the cost function we use what is known as gradient descent so the gradient descent mechanism identifies how to change the weights and biases so that the cost function is minimized and there is also what is known as the rate or the learning rate that is what is shown here as slower and faster so you need to specify what should be the learning rate now if the learning rate is very small then it will probably take very long to train whereas if the learning rate is very high then it will appear to be faster but then it will probably never what is known as converge now what is convergence now we are talking about a few terms here convergence is like this this is a representation of convergence so the whole idea of gradient descent is to optimize the cost function or minimize the cost function in order to do that we need to represent the cost function as this curve we need to come to this minimum value that is what is known as the minimization of the cost function now what happens if we have the learning rate very small is that it will take very long to come to this point on the other hand if you have large higher learning rate what will happen is instead of stopping here it will cross over because the learning rate is high and then it has to come back so it will result in what is known as like an oscillation so it will never come to this point which is known as convergence instead it will go back and forth so these are known as hyperparameters, the learning rate and so on and these have to be those numbers or those values we can determine typically using trial and error out of experience we we try to find out these values so that is the gradient descent mechanism to optimize the cost function and that is what is used to train our neural network this is another representation of how the training process works and here in this example we are trying to classify these images whether they are cats or dogs and as you can see actually each image is fed in each time one image is fed rather and these values of x1 x2 up to xn are the pixel values within this image okay so those values are then taken and for each of those values a weight is multiplied and then it goes to the next layer and then to the next layer and so on ultimately it comes as the output layer and it gives an output as whether it is a dog or a cat remember the output will never be a named output so these would be like a zero or a one and we say okay zero corresponds to dogs and one corresponds to cats so that is the way it typically happens this is a binary uh, classification we have similar situations where there can be multiple classes which means that there will be multiple more neurons in the output layer okay so this is once again a quick representation of how the forward propagation and the backward propagation works so the information is going in this direction which is basically the forward propagation and at the output level we find out what is the cost function the difference is basically sent back as uh, part of the backward propagation and gradient descent then 
adjust the weights and biases for the next iteration. This happens iteratively till the cost function is minimized. And that is when we say the whole the network has converged or the training process has converged. And there can be situations where convergence may not happen in rare cases. But by and large, the network will converge. And after maybe a few iterations, it could be tens of iterations or hundreds of iterations, depending on what exactly the number of iterations can vary. And then we say, okay, we are getting a certain accuracy and we say that is our threshold, maybe 90% accuracy. We, we stop at that and we say that the system is trained. The trained model is then deployed for production and so on. So that is the way the neural network training happens. Okay, so that is the way classification works in deep learning using neural network. And this slide is an animation of this whole process. As you can see, the forward propagation the data is going forward from the input layer to the output layer and there is an output and the error is calculated the cost function is calculated and that is fed back as a part of backward propagation and that whole process repeats once again okay so remember in neural networks the training process is nothing but uh, finding the best values of the weights and biases for each and every neuron in the network that's all training of neural network consists of finding the optimal values of the weights and biases so that the accuracy is maximum all right so with that we come to the end of the session you all have a great day thank you very much hi there if you like this video subscribe to the simply learn youtube channel and click here to watch similar videos to nerd up and get certified, click here.